I think one crucial thing she brought up is we we're talking about children. There are children, unaccompanied children, children that are toddlers in these camps alone. Six have died since the end of last year. And introduce the next speaker, Andrew, who's going to talk about what it's like exactly in those camps right now. Andrew. I'm going to describe to you what exactly is happening inside of these so-called concentration camps. I warn you that it's not exactly easy to hear, but I believe that it's important for uh, people to be aware of the grueling details that are happening inside of these camps. Because certainly no one can deny how unjust and inhumane the camps are after knowing the details. This isn't just another thing that the Trump administration does that can get swept under the rug. First, I want to start with the definition of a concentration camp. A place in which large numbers of people, especially political prisoners or members of persecuted minorities, are deliberately imprisoned in a relatively small area with inadequate facilities, sometimes to provide forced labor or await mass execution. Right now, in the United States, there are over 130 documented concentration camps in numerous states and Puerto Rico. It was actually just this morning that I heard an estimate of how many people are being held inside of the camps inside of the United States right now. Currently, 54,000 people are being held inside of ICE facilities. Now, for the, the details, which come from a group of lawyers that were able to enter inside of a child camp in Clint, Texas, which is near El Paso. The camp in Clint wasn't initially meant to be a camp for children. It was initially built for adults, and it's not clear exactly when it was converted into a camp for children. This camp has a maximum capacity of 100 people. However, uh, over 350 children were in there when the lawyers visited. The children are being kept 25 to 100 people per room, where the lights are left on for 24 hours a day. They're not provided even the simplest things like blanket, blankets, soap, toothbrushes. Uh, they even have open toilets. Uh, at the time that the lawyers visited, the child that had been there the longest had been there for 26 days. The government is only allowed to hold people, actually, for 21 days. It said that the children are allowed to shower less than once per week, sometimes completely unable to change their clothing the entire time that they're there. There's no one taking care of the children. Simply the older children are taking care of the younger children. The children told the visitors that they're essentially being starved. They're being served frozen food that isn't even cooked all the way. I should also add that the lawyers claim that only 12% of the children actually were in a situation where the government is legally allowed to be keeping them. At one point there was a lice outbreak where six children had lice. The other children were then provided two lice combs for the entire camp. One girl, uh, one very young girl, lost one of the combs and then she was yelled at by the guards who subsequently took her blankets and then forced her to sleep on the cold concrete for the following few nights. Perhaps the most gruesome part of this, uh, what this group reported is the fact that nearly every child inside of this facility was sick. Which isn't surprising, considering that they're keeping children in such close quarters and denying them access to any sort of sanitation. This isn't surprising because this is exactly what happens when you put so many people in such close quarters and treat them in the way that I've described. There were, it's reported that nearly uh, 20... Nearly 20 children, uh, while they were there, were being held under quarantine, and the lawyers were completely denied access to even talk to them. I like to bring attention to the fact that the lack of a sanitary environment is exactly how many people perished in the Holocaust, not just from gas chambers. And Frank, perhaps one of the most famous faces of the Holocaust, as well as her sister, actually died of typhus fever due to the poor conditions inside of Bergen-Belsen. The constant consequences of camps can live on for generations, and I want to tell you how German concentration camps affected me personally, even though I was born 50 years after the Holocaust was over. From what I know, my great-grandmother and her two siblings somehow had the rare opportunity to escape from Auschwitz. As far as we know, only my great-grandmother survived, and she resettled in a Jewish ghetto in the south side of Chicago, where my grandmother was raised. I never met my great-grandmother because she died before I was born but her pain was passed down to me through uh, all of the generations. I moved to the Bible Belt when I was four and my world was crushed. I never felt like I fit in, so I spent a lot of time thinking about how my life could have been different if my family hadn't been forced to leave Poland and entirely wiped out. To be honest, it wasn't until two years ago that I ever even thought of moving to Germany because I remember listening to stories of how Germany is the reason why my family no longer lives in Poland. I visited Poland for the first time uh, this year in January and I had a really weird, sad feeling when I first got there. I realized that I know virtually nothing about my people or my culture because my Polish experience was robbed from me. 
Hopefully this shows you the long-lasting effects that concentration camps can have. No, we're not le yet at Auschwitz level of terror, but it wasn't until many years after the opening of the camps in Germany where the Germans started the systemic execution of Jews and other minorities. But we can't deny that over 30 people have already died inside of the facilities in the United States, and their families will have to deal with the pain for many years to come. That's why I urge that we all need to take action now. It's reported that this Sunday, ice raids are planned where they plan to capture more than 2,000 more people. To end, just one month ago, I visited Yad Vashem in Jerusalem, and right around, that was right around the time where I started to see the reports of the conditions inside of the camps that I've described to you. I'd like to end with one quote that I saw in the museum that stuck out to me. It's written by Martin Niemuller, a German theologian who initially didn't oppose the Nazis. He was imprisoned in Sachsenhausen and Dachau camps for seven years and ultimately survived. They came for the communists, and I did not object, for I was not a communist. Then they came for the socialists, and I did not object, for I was not a socialist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not accept, object, for I was not a Jew. When they came for me, there was no one left to object.